There we go. All right, everybody. Uh, hope you're doing very, very well. Azrin, the language nerd here, as per usual. And today we have a guest who is... Hello, everybody. My name is Mike Muntel. I'm a CEO at Linguist. Good stuff. So I'm very curious. Before we started recording, you said you're from Estonia. Give me five facts about Estonia. Tell me a couple of things about Estonia that maybe we don't know. Um, probably you do not know where Estonia is situated. It's uh, close to Finland and Sweden. It's a very small country. Only a little bit more than a million people are speaking uh, Estonian as a native language. I guess you have not wow. learned Estonian as a polyglot. No, I do not speak Estonian. What, <laughs> uh, what uh, language family is Estonian part of? It's a Finno-Ugric language family, so it's very, very separated branch the same as finnish um, and uh, hungarian mm -hmm. that separated ten thousand years ago so we really do not share any common words almost interesting what's life like in estonia life is good uh, people who live in estonia they enjoy estonia a lot <laughs> okay it was a former soviet union con uh, soviet union country and we broke off from soviet union uh, in early 90s. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So is it, um, what's the landscape like? Is it very mountainous? Is it very, is it more, <laughs> totally, of, is it more do, totally flat, totally, totally flat. flat. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. So that's what things are like here where I live. So I'm in, in Canada, but specifically where I live in Canada is, is a city called Calgary. So if you mm -hmm. look at the geography of Canada, we have, um, we have these three provinces in a row that mm -hmm. are called the prairies mm -hmm. and our province doesn't quite have exactly the stereotype but if we go a little bit over towards the uh towards the east we have a province that has many stereotypes that so there's nothing there it's completely flat there's just cows and now obviously it's a stereotype it's not exactly true but there's certain certain truth to it <laughs> By the way, do you know what uh, your name means in Estonian? Oh, does it mean your something? Your family, yeah, your family name, right? Oh, my family name, what does it mean? Yeah. It means storm, hurricane, tornado. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. Interesting. <laughs> it's a very, so my last name in India, um, in the north, it's not a very, it's not a very common last name. Mm -hmm. um, in the south it is. In the north, it's more of a common first name. So often... Often when I meet Indian people, they'll see my name and they'll call me by my last name because they'll, they'll think, that, oh, that must be his first name. And they'll mm -hmm. call me by my last name. <laughs> Storm. How do you pronounce it in Estonian? Rayu. Rayu. Yes. Interesting. Oh, that's really cool. I didn't know that. <laughs> that's that's uh, very, very interesting. I thought for a second maybe it was like my first, actually, it's on my shirt today. I thought you meant maybe the first name, like Azarin. I thought, oh, wow, Azarin actually means something in a language because my name is actually made up. So it's a made up name. So. Interesting. That's really cool. Um, and in, uh, in Estonia, is it mostly, um, is it mostly people like is it mostly Estonian people are there a lot of tourists are there a lot of people from other countries that live there that move there yeah it's uh, m mostly Estonian people but as uh, we were occupied by Soviet Union after the second world war then uh, there is a significant amount of Russian population that okay. is also the reason why um, indirectly or maybe even directly I started this company hmm interesting very, because very when I was um, uh, at school, then uh, in the Soviet Union, we had to learn Russian. And you know, if you have to do something, it doesn't go very well. So it right. was like a huge social experiment, how to spend 12 years, everybody's time to teach them Russian so that they do not learn anything. The whole mm -hmm. generation didn't learn anything. Not only really? Me. So even, so what, even though it was forced to learn Russian, most people in your experience that you knew didn't really learn very well. Yeah, pro um, probably I have a little bit biased uh, view on it because of my own very, very slow progress, but others were not much better. <laughs> what were some of the learning strategies they used? Like how did they try to teach you or make you learn? Hmm. It was just the school system, I think. And, uh, um, 
I, I think it uh, taps on this uh, um, internal resistance that people have if they do not choose things to do voluntarily. Mm -hmm. So yep. I think this is the background, actually. So did it feel, so when you're in school and I was being taught, did it feel forced? Like, I'll give you an example. So the reason I asked is because, so for example, I went to what's called a French immersion school. So my schooling was in French. Now, I was a child when I, I was five years old when I first went to a French immersion school. Um, and while it was, it was forced in the sense that, like, that was the language we had to do because that's what our parents put us into. Um, but at the same time, generally, the French immersion, when people go through French immersion, when people are going through this French system in Canada, generally, people will come out with a some kind of level in French, whether it's very fluent, whether it's just acceptable, usually people end up. So in Russia, when, what was the feeling that you remember in the classes? Did it feel forced? Did it feel like, oh my God, I don't want to do this? Like, what was the feeling? Well, um, as, as a kid, I was afraid of these language classes. I tried to really? escape from this. Yeah. I, and, and again, this is partially because I started the company because I had so painful memories about language learning that I wanted to build technology to speed learning up a lot. And when I became a physicist, then um, I didn't think about this pain. But um, um, when, when I moved to um, Switzerland, to Geneva, uh, because I was working at the Center of European Nuclear Research for several years, and this is French-speaking area, then uh, I realized that I'm living in another country. I do not learn the, this local language. I felt very bad about myself. And then I had this experience that I had spent thousands and thousands of hours learning English and Russian and never succeeded. And as a scientist, I thought that, okay, I, I would like to know actually what would be theoretically the shortest possible time to learn a new language from just um, um, the data perspective. How much mm -hmm. is there technically data in learning a new language and what is my best um, data absorption speed <laughs> yeah uh, and i figured out that actually people can learn a new language potentially in maybe a little bit more than a couple of months and there are certainly people who do it uh, and maybe you have met them as well Poly polyglots uh, learn languages really quickly because they're highly motivated right mm -hmm. um but it put my thoughts into the track where i want to build software that enables this for everybody, especially people like me who have had huge struggles learning new languages. Right. <clears throat> Interesting. So they were you able to pick up French eventually? Yes, this was the starting point that okay. um, I, uh, when I had this idea, this, this uh, theoretical outcome, um, um, at the time, it was 200 hours, 200 hours of learning. And I, I had experienced, I calculated thousands. Uh, I think in total, for example, English, I have learned 10,000 hours for sure. <laughs> okay. and, uh, and it was in so... Uh, big contrast with what I had experienced that I just had to, to, to build some more prototype for myself that could it really work? And of course, I was very motivated to test my prototype out uh, that was using machine learning uh, and uh, some other cool mathematical and natural language processing methods. And uh, although it was created completely automatically, so I didn't know anything about French, I didn't involve anybody who knew French, just generated the automatic content and learned two months with it. And out of curiosity, I uh, took the national examination of French in Estonia that um, um, high school students take after learning 10 years uh, mm -hmm. French. And I was very amazed when I passed on the average level that they did, starting from after scratch. Two months. Yeah, uh, of course, my language, le my language level was not perfect. I scored well in vocabulary. I, I uh, was able to read pretty much um, 
any text, uh, but my speaking skills were much, much worse. So in, in some, some areas I scored higher, some areas I scored lower, but on average it was uh, kind of, wow, um, this is worth. You scored higher <laughs> on, the, on the reading and writing and scored lower on, this, on the speaking and listening? Is that yeah, how it was? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't have um, uh, speaking and, and reproduction uh, uh, component in my prototype. And uh, that was logical that I didn't mm -hmm. uh, develop on that that much. Because it was so in your, in, your, in your perspective, like when you say someone is able to, let someone is generally able to go learn a language. Let's say, as you said, in, in a couple of months, a few months, what level of what level of, of fluency do you think someone someone would have if they follow, as you said, some very um, specific methodologies? How, how what level do you think they would end up with? Like, how, what level of fluency? I think it's I think it's very 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 different uh, because um, um, of course it depends a lot uh, on motivation. Right. If you're hi highly motivated, then you learn a lot. If you're not motivated, then you just to try to do everything that uh, I did uh, <laughs> at school when I had to learn Russian and didn't learn anything. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but um, well, let's um, say you're highly motivated. You're highly um, motivated for three months, two through two, two to four months. Yeah, if you're highly motivated, uh, then it still <laughs> depends on your background knowledge, because mm. uh, every new thing that you learn connects to uh, some other things that you already know. Mm -hmm. And the more you have connections, the easy, easier it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is the mm, magic of uh, computers that computers can actually. Um, linguist as a software can actually map quite precisely what do you know and then select uh, exercises based on uh, based on the precise data that what could stick better um, based on your previous knowledge mm -hmm. and of course it depends also on your personal abilities some people have a, a shorter memory some people have longer memory but all those things can be measured in the learning process and uh, it's unconventional because I'm, I'm coming from nuclear physics where measurements <laughs> are very normal things mm -hmm. in language learning. Um, it's, um, uh, it, it has not been traditional uh, mm -hmm. approach. But I, I think throughout your own experience, I think you have probably experienced it as well that if you... If you um, um, your learning... Uh, um, uh, uh, learning capability and teaching capability accelerates over time. That's something that you was able to do in six months um, when you started. Now you're doing in maybe two or three months. For sure, yeah, because you get it's like any skill, right? When you get yeah, better yeah. at a skill, you get yeah. you get faster with it. Mm -hmm. So, what is the? I guess talk to me. Talk to me about the premise of of, of linguist. Um. Like what's the like? How does it work? Like what's the what's some of the the strategies involved? How does it work? How does it help people learn? Um, you mentioned I might have misheard you. If I misheard you, let me know. You're saying you want to create a program that does allow someone to achieve a certain level of fluency within a few months. Like how was that achieved? Yeah, I'm. My personal passion is to accelerate human learning as such, mm -hmm. and I think that language learning is um, is. Uh, a good starting point because mm -hmm. language learning uh, connects to education in general because most mm -hmm. of the people who learn languages they they need this language for mm -hmm. better education mm -hmm. and uh, you can chunk up language into small pieces and then measure how do you memorize uh, different things um, so it's a ni nice model for exploring uh, human learning in general and uh, we have already quite good uh, scientific results. There are some universities which have done studies. Um, so how? So I guess what is linguist? Okay. How, how, does it, <laughs> like, how does it? How does it get someone to? I'm trying to um, figure out because it sounds it sounds like such a it sounds like such a big yeah it sounds like uh, such a big statement that someone could go use an app, an, an app I'm assuming. Yeah. An app yeah. and then have a certain it's, level of fluency in two to three months. Like, well, it sounds like such yeah. a huge. I've, it's, I've rarely heard that statement made. It sounds so mind blowing. I'm trying to figure out what methodology you're using. Yeah, it, it, it is mind blowing, and I, I have to manage your expectations that mm -hmm. this um, 
um, it doesn't work for everybody yet. Um, okay. And uh, um, all, all things um, have not been figured out yet. It, uh, we do not cover all of the aspects of language okay. learning, but what we do essentially, we focus on vocabulary acquisition. Okay. And uh, um, it's a language learning application. You can use it in a smartphone or desktop computer. Uh, and it solves, or it, uh, we're, we're trying to answer two questions in mm -hmm. an innovative way. Uh, one question is um, what to learn. And another question is how to learn. What mm -hmm. to learn is a special tool that enables students or teachers um, create courses for themselves or, or their students or their classes so that they can uh, type in some um, um, keywords or drop in some text and it generates language vocabulary course automatically in a couple of seconds. So it, it generates uh, words, translations, example sentences, audio files, everything. And it's based on what, sorry, that's based on? It's based on, um, it's, um, we are using natural language processing and uh, machine learning to generate this content. Okay. Because manually, it takes, as a teacher, it takes you a lot of time to create content for every single student because the yep. interests are different. But with this tool, you can do it literally in a couple of seconds. Okay. And uh, this is important because if you have a really good uh, learning tool, you can really accelerate learning, then it's important to set the direction first because if you're running to the wrong direction, you will never get to where mm -hmm. you want to get. So that's, you figured out what to learn and then how does the how yes. to learn come and in? now how to learn. Uh, uh, it's based on a flashcard system where people have to uh, type in the words that they learn into a small uh, gap in a sentence. The sentence gives um, context um, and understanding beyond just, just the word. And while people do this, sometimes they fail, sometimes they get things correct. All of this data that uh, um, uh, we collect, we can use to measure how the memory works. So we know how, how the short term, short term memory works, long term memory, medium term memory, very precisely for every single person and, not, and also for every single item that they have learned. So we, have, we call it a knowledge map. So we know word by word, concept by concept, what do you know exactly? We know when you will forget it. And then if we have this data, then machine learning uh, uh, techniques can make decisions. When is the best time to review one thing or another thing? Mm -hmm. And optimizes so that uh, you could learn the biggest amount of new things at the shortest uh, um, amount of time for yourself but, uh, personally. Right, totally. So how many, in, in your experience, if someone wants to get the best results using Lingvist for themselves, in an ideal world, how much should they be, how much should they be working with it on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, uh, so let's, again, let's hypothetically say they're extremely motivated and they're trying to learn as fast as they possibly can and they've got the time to dedicate towards language learning. To be honest, uh, the more the better still, because the more intensively you do something, uh, they um, more results you get. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there is a uh, danger that if you start doing it like a six hours in a day, then yeah. next day you well, will be too tired. What's this, maybe this is a better question? I'm not sure if you looked at the stats. What's the average that people use it now on a daily basis? People who use it very successfully, they they use regularly half an hour a day, one hour okay. a day. Okay. And as we do not cover all of the aspects of language learning, then it works the best uh, with uh, live tutoring, uh, like teachers, for example, using it in the classroom. I um, see. Okay. Um, Let's see. It's the best pair yeah. with something else. Yeah, there are way there are um, uh, schools in uh, America who are using it uh, so that uh, in the beginning of the class, uh, stu students get uh, five minute exercise with linguist and uh, they will have some homework with linguists 10 or 20 minutes and then teachers um, teach the rest of the time and what the teachers say is that um, that uh, uh, people who 
teachers who have been teaching for 20 years, uh, they say that they, in, in the first uh, year they are doing things with the students that they even never did it in the third year. That all of the students, not only the good students are progressing well, but also the bad students. So um, we see that it really works well together with human component as a, like a teacher component. Totally. Um, you can try it out as a, as a, as a teacher, you know, this uh, course yeah. wizard and... And so for the last little chunk of our, of our time here, um, I wanted to see like, what are some different um, language learning tips you would give people based on your, your personal experience and of course your experience with whatever experience you've had with learners through your, through your current work with Lingvist. Um, based on my own experience, um, one thing is definitely consistency that if you build a habit around learning something, uh, this habit supports you a lot um, um, get, getting through the difficult part. It's uh, really ha habit building is one really important part of learning in general, I think. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that don't be afraid of mistakes mm -hmm. because mistakes are actually good. <laughs> mistakes uh, teach you and you do not have to be always correct. Mm -hmm. um, what uh, we see through our data and we have a lot of data, we have data for 3 million people, is that uh, people who learn at a level where um, they fail 20% of time, they learn the fastest because uh, if you get always correct, then it's too easy for you. If you uh, get uh, uh, things correct less than 70 or 60%, then it's too challenging for you. But 80% is something, 80, 85 is something where you, you are slightly out of your comfort zone and it gives you the best, uh, best age in learning. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting thought that makes a lot of sense, I think. Um, when, when I think a lot about my own personal language learning as well, like I often, the environments where I've learned best are the environments where I'm not actually the best at, mm -hmm. but I'm not the worst. Like when I'm the absolute most mm -hmm. worst and it's like, I'm way out of my element. Yes. Like I, I don't learn anything or I learn very little. And yes, like, oh, you God, get stressed well. and, and, and you uh, can't keep your brain just doesn't yes. know what to do. But if you're in this environment yeah. where you think, Oh my God, I'm, Hmm, there's a lot I don't know here, but it's not so hard that you just go, oh my God, this is so hard and just quit. There is actually a very oh. interesting mechanism in the brain that um, if you are, if things are too difficult for you, you are in a um, stressful situation, then actually there is a neurochemical reason why you can't remember things because the stress hormones, cortisol and uh, glucocorticoid, they, uh, doesn't let uh, memories, they, they suppress uh, the neural connections in your hippocampus where you, you um, store your memories. So it's like a neurological reason why in, the stress, uh, in, a, in a big stress situation, you can't actually memorize things. Mm, fascinating. Which going full circle, that might make a lot of sense as to why people struggled learning Russian. If they were exactly. stressed in the classes. E exactly. They, they can't remember. Exactly. Interesting. Well, and the, I, and the motivation drops, right? Of course. <laughs> it's all a big circle. Hmm. So, well, I know you're, you're a little bit tight on time here. So let's wrap, let's wrap this up so you can be on time for your next appointment. I appreciate your time for, for, for the interview today. Um, any final things you want to say before you finish? Just thank you so much. I admire so much your mission and passion to teach languages to people. So it's a, uh, I feel very connected uh, with what you are doing, or, although I'm doing in a different way, but sure. hopefully in a complementary way. <laughs> totally. Well, um, have a good rest of your evening in your case. Um, everyone, thank you for watching slash listening. And, um, and yeah, I guess we'll chat soon. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.